Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra, the 17th chapter of the Quran says, begins the surah with, after a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. Allah says, Subhanallah, glory be to the one who took his servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the sacred mosque, the Kaaba, and the mosque around it, the Masjid al-Haram, to where? Where did he take him on that night? Nowhere in the world except al-Masjid al-Aqsa, to the furthest mosque to the mosque in Jerusalem, in Bayt al-Maqdis. That's where he took our Prophet on Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. He took him to Palestine. He took him to Palestine, the land of the Prophets, where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then led every single Prophet whose blessed foot ever graced this earth. All of their feet, 124,000, prayed behind him at Aqsa, in Palestine, on that night. That is our masjid. That is the masjid of the Muslims. That is the first qibla that the Muslims faced. For 16, or some say 17 months, after the prayer began as an obligation upon the Muslims, they didn't face the Kaaba. They didn't face Mecca. They faced Masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa, the furthest mosque. The Sahaba knew who among them prayed to both Qiblas. And there's a masjid in Medina today, Masjid al-Qiblatayn, where we know they were praying towards, towards Masjid al-Aqsa. And in the middle of their prayer, the ayah came down that says, turn and face in Masjid al-Haram. And in the middle of their prayer, they turned and faced it. And that masjid today is known as the masjid of the two Qiblas. The last Sahabi, the last Sahaba, companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who prayed to both Qiblas as a Muslim, was Anas ibn Malik. And how many times do we hear his name when he repeats, when he narrates, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this. So much of our faith and our deen and our practice, we take from Anas ibn Malik, who was a khadim, a servant of the volunteer servant of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his mother had placed him in the service of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I am the last of the Muslims who has prayed to both of the Qiblas. That is Masjid Al-Aqsa. Abu Dhar Al-Ghifari, one of the early Muslims asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, what was the first mosque on this earth? This earth that we live on, all of the children of Adam that we live on, what was the first house that was built for the worship of Allah? To announce the oneness of Allah and to remember Allah. He said, what was the first mosque that was placed on earth? And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it was Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the sacred mosque, Mecca, the Kaaba. And then Abu Dhar Al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, said, then which one? He said, the furthest mosque Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. Not only the first Qibla for the Muslims, but the second Masjid that was ever on this earth. That's a very, very holy place. And not only to the Muslims, but to all people who recognize the blessedness of that land. People of faith who know what that land means. And that land will remain Mubarak will remain blessed until the end of time. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that that land is the land of the Mahshar, the resurrection. And that land is the land of ribat, of holding fast like in a fortress. And, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about the blessed people who remained in Al-Aqsa, who will remain in Al-Aqsa. And he said there will come a time, this is our Messenger telling us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, there will come a time that land where you can look upon Masjid Al-Aqsa 
will be the most valuable thing that you can attain. People won't even be able to get it. And now we're seeing that. We've been seeing that for decades. The ayah doesn't only mention Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah says, من المسجد الأقصى من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله that we have given blessing to all around it. To all around it. On that night that he went sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Masjid al-Aqsa, in the path, Jibreel alayhi salam stopped and they prayed in Medina. They prayed in Medina. He knew where the Mahjar, where the Hijrah will be to. They stopped and they prayed in Beit Laham, Bethlehem. And he was told, this is the birthplace of Isa alayhi salam. Where the Prophet Jesus Christ, Isa alayhi salam, was born in Bethlehem. And there are still Christian, Christian Arabs. Christian Arabs who say Allah, who say it like that in Arabic. And they're there from the time of Isa until now. And even they get disgraced by the occupying forces. We've seen the videos. We've seen funeral processions of Christians in Bethlehem who will follow Isa alayhi salam and in his birthplace be attacked by the police, the occupying forces. We've seen people, Christian Arabs, who come out of churches spit on by the occupying forces. This is not a question of Muslims or Islam. This is not a question of Arabs or non-Arabs. This is a question of oppression of the people of faith. The people who recognize that land as being holy. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on that blessed night journey, he saw the birthplace of Isa Alaihi Salam and he saw al Kathib al he saw al Kathib al Ahmar, the red hill where Musa Alaihi Salam is buried. And he saw him praying in his grave. He saw him praying in his grave. That land is blessed, is Mubarak. And we know the hurma, the sanctity, when you enter a blessed place. How much respect you show that. When you entered this masjid today, you recognized this is a blessed place. I have to have a little bit of extra respect and honoring of the people of that masjid. What do we think about Mecca? And what do we think about Medina? And what do then do we think about Al-Aqsa and what's around it? Alladhi barakna hawla. And from the areas that Allah has blessed around Aqsa is Gaza is the land of Gaza. Many people don't know much about Gaza. The people of Gaza pushed and pushed and pushed and now them trying to push them even further into a so-called humanitarian zone so that another Nakba can happen. What is special about Gaza? How did Allah bless it? When we narrate the lineage of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we say his father is Abdullah and his grandfather is Shayba Abdul Muttalib. And his father is Hashim. The great grandfather of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hashim is buried in Gaza. And for many people, they refer to Gaza not only as Gaza, Gaza to Hashim. That is Gaza, Gaza of Hashim. The blessed land of Gaza. Imam al-Shafi'i was born in Gaza. Imam al-Shafi'i was born in Gaza. He is Ghazawi. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold the coming of Imam al-Shafi'i. He told us about Imam al-Shafi'i. How did he do it? He said, O oh Allah, guide the Quraysh for the knowledge of a scholar that comes from them, from Quraysh, will encompass the earth. O oh Allah, you have let the first of them taste bitterness. Meaning the people, the believers of Quraysh, they felt the harshness of the hand of kufr and oppression, of disbelief and of oppression. He said, let them, he said, you let the first of them taste bitterness, so let the latter of them taste reward. Imam Ahmad and others said, this is Shafi'i. Why? Because Shafi'i comes from the lineage is of Al-Muttalib, the brother of Hashim. Imam al-Shafi'i is Qurayshi, he's Muttalabi, 
and they said, this is the hadith. O oh Allah, guide Quraysh for the knowledge of the scholar. Alim Quraysh. The scholar of Quraysh that comes from them will encompass their earth. There is not a single Muslim household on this earth today that does not benefit from the knowledge of Imam al-Shafi'i. And he's from Gaza. After him, knowledge continued. And many of the ulama have come from Gaza. And to this day, it is a seat of knowledge. Some of the best research about this deen comes from the universities, the Sharia universities in Gaza. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, that we know him's name. Ibn Hajar, not al-Haytami, al-Asqalani. He's from Asqalan, Ashkelon, as they call it. Right outside the prison walls. It's a blessed place, but it's not just blessed to the Muslims. It's blessed to Jewish people. It's blessed to Christians. Let us remember that when Umar radiallahu anhu and the Muslims had come to Palestine and were going to conquer it, that it was conquered without bloodshed. Because they called for Umar to come and we know the famous story of Umar and how he came in his humility and trading off with his servant riding. And so when the king comes out in all his trappings of gold and he sees a man in ragged and, pa and patched clothing leading the camel and a servant on top of the camel. And this is the leader of the Muslims. He was amazed by the humility of the Muslims. And they gave the keys of Palestine to the Muslims. Umar radiallahu anhu did many things in that to respect the people there. When they invited him to pray in a church, he refused not to disrespect them. Be, but he, because he said, if I pray in this church, people will come after me, Muslims, and want to imitate what I did. And eventually the Muslims will make it a masjid. And I want you to keep it as a church. And he prayed on the chair, the stairs. And that masjid of Umar is still there today, right next to a church. Umar was amazed that the Jewish people of Medina had been kicked out by the Byzantines. And what did he do? He brought in Jewish people into al Bayt al-Maqdis. That's our deen. Those are our leaders. For 850 years, the church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the Christians believe that Isa السلام, was resurrected from, we have a different belief, but we recognize what they believe. That church for 850 years, the keys to that church, still to this day are in the, the hands of the Judah family. They put the keys of that church in a Muslim family's hands because the Christians were fighting over which denomination gets the rights to those keys. And so they said, let's solve it by putting it in the hands of Muslims. For 850 years and still to this day, and they have a key that is 500 years old and another one that is 850 years old. So this is not about Muslims hating other people of faith. The Jewish people have worshipped on that land alongside Muslims and Christians for thousands of years. And this is a long tradition, we see it. Even in Andalusia when the Inquisition happened and the Catholic, the ruling Catholic family was it wiping out anybody who was not Catholic, where did the Jews go? Where did the Jewish people go? They got asylum in Morocco, in Al Maghrib. They went asylum into the Ottoman Empire. They were protected, why? Because our messenger taught us that the non-Muslims who live amongst the Muslims are Ahlu Dhimma. They are the people of Dhimma. What does Dhimma mean? Fi dhimma tillahi wa rasulih. In the protection of Allah and His Messenger. Out of our service and our duty to Allah and His Messenger, we protect the people regardless of their faith. That is who we are as Muslims, regardless of what the media and the propaganda machine puts out against us. I want us also to remember that that blessed journey the night journey where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Messenger of Allah from Al Masjid al Haram to Al Masjid al Aqsa. Why did it happen and when did it happen? It happened in year 10 of the Risala. The Wahi comes down in Ghar Hira. That's year one of the revelation. 10 years later, the Isra happens on the year Am al Huzun, the year of sadness. What happened in that year? His uncle Abu Talib passed away. His blessed wife Khadija al Kubra radiallahu anha passed away. And then what happened in Ta'if happened. He was sad, stricken with grief. And so to show him, to Allah 
showing the Messenger of Allah that you are not forgotten, O Muhammad. You are not, we're going to remove your huzn and your pain. Where did Allah take him? He removed his huzn by taking him to Al-Aqsa, to Palestine. Let's think about that. Let's reflect on that. Of anywhere in the world, and Allah showed him the universes to the farthest reach of the universe, but before the farthest reach of the universe, He showed him Palestine. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did for him and for us. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to some of the Sahaba, would read Surah Al-Isra, this Surah that commemorates that journey, every night before sleeping. Let us not forget Palestine. Let us remember Palestine in every one of our days and in every single one of our nights, not because it's about being Arab or not Arab. It's about because it's from our deen. Could you imagine what would happen if there was an occupation of Medina or Mecca? Then what's the difference between an occupation of Al-Aqsa? Before the night journey, three years before that, Quraysh couldn't figure out what to do with the message of Islam, so they decided to place an embargo on the Muslims. Three years, they cut off from them food, they raised the price of food, for people outside, the Meccans, they said, nobody sell them food. Nobody interact from them. Don't marry from amongst them, and don't let them marry from amongst you. Cut them off. And the Bani Hashim, actually not all of the Muslims, just Bani Hashim. Hashim, who's buried in Gaza. His children, Bani Hashim, were stuck in the valley of Abu Talib. Shib Abi Talib. And for three years, lack of food, lack of water, to the point that People said the people of Mecca, they could hear the children crying from hunger. We've all heard the children of Gaza now crying. And what Quraysh did to the Muslims over there is nothing compared to what the occupying forces and the allies and Ru'us al-Kufr, the heads of Kufr in this world, are doing to people, not just Muslims, because there's Christians in Gaza as well. One of the oldest churches on the face of this earth is in Gaza. The Catholic monastery is out there praying for their own safety. Quraysh continued its propaganda. Quraysh pr pr uh, continued its economic struggle. And we see similarities today. Differences, but similarities. After three years, some of the notables of Quraysh who were not Muslim said, this is enough, enough is enough. Hisham ibn Amr and others like him said, O people of Mecca, do we eat and clothe ourselves while Banu Hashim are perishing, unable to buy or sell? By Allah, I will not sit down until this unjust document is torn up the document that they had written the embargo on. By the miracle of Allah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent word to them before that, even with, with Abu Talib, and there was no need to tear up the document because the document that they had placed in Kaaba was eaten by termites. And he knew about it even though he stuck in the Shi'ib and not able to go inside of the Kaaba. So the question is for us, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? When we see the Hisar, when we see an embargo, when we see destruction upon the people of Gaza, the blessed people of Gaza, Gaza, all people, Muslims and Christians and anybody else who lives there, what are we going to do? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and to give us the strength to do what He wants of us. Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, and peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amma ba'd fa ya ibadullah, usikum wa usi nafsi bi taqwa Allah. Ittaqwa Allah fa sirri wal ala niya, ittaqwa Allah wa yu'allimukum Allah. O servants of Allah, I encourage you and I encourage myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taqwa outwardly and taqwa inwardly. And if you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will will teach you. The people of the land of Hashim, Gaza to Hashim, the Gaza of Hashim, we should say to them, just like Hisham ibn Amr said to Quraysh, enough is enough, we should say, O oh, people of the world, do we eat and clothe ourselves and have safety while the people of Gaza to Hashim are perishing, not able to buy or sell, not able to get through a night of sleep, 
Are we going to sit by in our safety? What will we do? What are we going to do? We don't, none, no one of us has the answer. But people are speaking up. And people are saying things. And people are recognizing. And we know that from our deen, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that if you cannot change something with your hand, change it with your tongue. And if you cannot change it with your tongue, then have rejection of that thing in your heart, and that is the weakest of faith. So the least we can do is look at that and say, Allahumma inna hadha munkar. Oh Allah, this is wrong. And walau qaddarna la ghayyarna. And if we were able to, we would have changed it. But that's ad'afu iman That's not where we should be. We should at least be speaking out. We should be speaking out, especially in this day and age, when the propaganda machine and the spin machine just like Quraysh had their propaganda machine. When the Messenger of Allah and his beauty came, and the beautiful things that he taught, they said he's a sorcerer, and he's wicked, and he splits between mother and child, and father and, and, and son. All of the propaganda they sent, we're seeing similar and worse against Islam and Muslims. Now if you speak out, if you say Palestine, if you say the word Palestine, they want to say it's anti-Semitic. They want to say that if you hold the flag of Palestine, that it's an, a, a, an assault on another people. Where is the freedom of expression? Where is the freedom of speech that this country that we live in was founded on? Where is that? In the tech companies, they're shutting down accounts left, left and right. Messages are going out from universities uh, 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 that, that are, that are one-sided. We have to push back. And push back in wherever area that Allah has put you in. If you're in academia, push back there. If you're in your workplace, push back there. And there are organizations like CARE and others that are doing wonderful work to educate the Muslims on how best to push back. In your workplace, in your, in your, in your, in your schools, to educate about the issue. To have some of these books of hadith. There's 40 hadith collections about Al-Aqsa and that land. Get those books and learn it so that we know this is not a political issue. This is part of our deen. It's Mecca and Medina and Aqsa. Those three, the first of the two qiblas and the third of the, of the harams, of the sanctuaries. This is part of our deen. We have to understand the tricks that are being placed against us. We have to understand that where do we push back with boycotting and di uh, divesting and sanctions? Where do we do that? And we are here, brothers and sisters, let's remind ourselves, here in the Silicon Valley, where the software for the military machine of this country that exports it all around, it exports its war, just like Fir'aun has his junood, has his soldiers, and he would send them out for corruption and facade in this land, the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, is a death valley. Because much of the weaponry that's used that we're watching now, the F-35s that are going over Gaza and dropping those bombs, where are they dev developed? Lockheed Martin right here in Silicon Valley. So we as Muslims, we have to stand up. Those Muslims who are in there, they have to ask themselves, what are they doing there and how are they pushing back on there? Right across the street, Boeing. 45% of Boeing's contract are military. We have to ask ourselves, it's not enough to not buy Coca-Cola and Starbucks. We have to really say, what are we doing as Muslims in the Silicon Valley where the heart of the technology that fuels the military machine is being done? and reach out to our representatives. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give, to give Nasr, to give victory to the Muslims, and to give victory to the people of Palestine. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the oppression from the people of Palestine and from the people everywhere. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send down His mercy and to send down His rahmah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in Iman and in Dua, to increase us because we are, in the, we are the ones in need of the Dua of Ahl Ghazza. We are the ones in the need of the du'a of Ahl Ghazza. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove their pain and to help them rebuild and to allow us to be honored to help them rebuild and to stop this oppression.